Thank you for joining us. Throughout history, the Jewish people have endured persecution and exile until the rebirth of the modern state of Israel. During centuries of dispersal, Jewish people have sought refuge in the few countries that welcomed them. One of these is China. To tell us more about this important part of history are Professor Xu Xin of the School of Foreign Studies and Director of the Center for Judaic Studies at Nanjing University in China. And joining us also is Dr. Abram Fischler, President Emeritus of Nova Southeastern University, who will speak with us and the professor following these messages. Healthcare costs are bankrupting America. The cause is federal overregulation. Unless a free market is restored, no one, including government, business, or individuals, will be able to afford the high cost of health care. My new book, Pharmocracy, exposes the corruption that causes needless suffering and death while our nation sinks into financial ruin. The solutions in this book can save Medicare and improve the lives of aging Americans. Pharmocracy provides an irrefutable basis to stop the suffocating impact of health care regulation. The benefit will be better medical technology at far lower prices. Fight back against corruption. Pharmocracy shows how we can tear down bureaucratic barriers that push health care costs beyond the reach of the American people. We can do it. This essential book is only $24, and you'll also receive a free subscription to Life Extension magazine. Get your book today. China is one of the most fascinating tourist attractions in the world. The Great Wall of China, built more than 2,000 years ago to protect China from northern invaders, draws millions of visitors every year, in addition to the many other unique destinations. These include the cities of Kaifeng, Harbin and Shanghai, where Jewish communities thrived for over seven centuries. China offered a safe haven for many thousands of Jewish people who fled from the persecution in Russia in the beginning of the 20th century and from Nazi Germany. More than 30,000 Jewish people moved to Shanghai and thereby survived World War II. Most of them left after the war, but many still remain in China. Visitors can see the Jewish Museum, the ghetto, and the synagogues and important buildings in Shanghai. In Beijing, there's a new Jewish community center, including a museum and synagogue. China is not only an endlessly captivating land with a continuous civilization of 5,000 years, along with modern-day extraordinary achievements, but China shares an important part in Jewish history as well. With us now is Professor Abe Fischler, President Emeritus of Nova Southeastern University and Professor Xu Xin of Nanjing University in China. Professor, it's good to have you back on the show. Oh, glad to, to be us. here. Abe, an honor glad always to, to have you. you. Dr. Schiffler, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I'd like to ask you to share some conversation with Professor Fischler and discuss as colleagues your view on the challenges of education for your individual perspectives. Thanks, Richard, for the kind introduction. Good to uh, meet you, yeah. since uh, I've been to all around your country, but not to your country. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, you got to visit us. I, uh, I've been to Taiwan okay. and Hong Kong. When was that? Oh, uh, with Dr. Mao about uh, five, six years ago. Okay. Uh, we had programs going on in 
Thailand, mm -hmm. Korea, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, Taiwan. Oh. Um, yeah. With Nova's institution? With Nova University. They have branch there in Taiwan now? Well, we use Dr. Mao. From, oh. He lives in Sacramento, but goes back and forth to, to that part of China, to Taiwan. Do they have students there or high well, students? We had uh, uh, clusters of students, 25 studying at the master's level and 25 studying at the doctoral level. Oh my. And uh, it was very interesting. Uh, oh, that's when I started to learn about the educational environment and... Uh, yeah, if that can be done in China. I don't know that distance education, uh, how it happened. I well, didn't what, watch that. What we, what we did was to find students that had a common interest to getting a degree. So we had about 25 to 30 in the MBA program. We had about the uh, same amount in the first doctoral program. Mm -hmm. and what but we who did, will what give the issue degree? Nova Southeastern uh, University. Ah. We would fly professors there. Mm -hmm. They would spend a weekend with the students. To teach? To teach okay. and interact with the students. And then they would come back the following month again. Mm -hmm. So they had four two-day sessions. Every month? No, one two-day session every month, one session. Uh -huh. In between time, that's when they did their reading. Okay. And they had a cluster coordinator there, full-time, uh -huh. uh, who had been degreed with us, so he knew the process. Okay. okay. And uh, then every summer we had a summer institute where they came together in this country along with the other students from, from this country. Oh, really? For a week, for eight days. Uh -huh. And that's how we provided educational opportunity. How long will it take three to years, finish? It would take three years for them. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them took a fourth year to finish their dissertation. dissertation. But there wasn't a dissertation that was theoretical. Oh. They had to use their schools as a laboratory. I see. So okay. they learned the first year they took a small project and they did it in their school to bring about change. The next year they worked with a colleague or two or three to do one that was a little larger, mm -hmm. uh, but also sometimes more of the community kind of change rather than just one institution. And then the third year they had to work on their own. Okay, okay. Uh, but they also but took, if they come to United States, how would they come as a student? They or would they come as a student for the summer. Okay, I see. And uh, most of them stayed for a week or two extra. I see. And okay. visited the schools and visited Wonderful. with okay. people. and. So it was a it was a way for them to form a cluster. We called it a cluster, a group of students okay. working in the same area, uh -huh. but not not necessarily in the same institutions. I see. Okay. So okay. we had principals from schools, uh -huh. uh, and uh, but within the within the country, they were more, more Koreans or from uh -huh. Thailand. Abe, this is very interesting, and I'd like to ask you, Professor, to please tell Abe about your Judaic Studies program in China. When China decided to have open door policy and reform and make it possible for Chinese academia to resume what we call Occidental studies. And Jewish study become part of Occidental studies, being reintroduced to Chinese universities, that how everything started. And also one of the reasons was many Chinese were sent abroad in the beginning of the 80s, and when they returned, they brought back many information, because quite few of them had contact with Jews, or their professors were Jews. Uh, for me, it was a special event. I lived with the Jewish family when I was in this country. I was deeply touched, and um, actually I'm not the uh, only exception. There were other people, though they did not uh, spend that long time live with Jewish family, but one way or another, they had contact with Jewish professors, Jewish people in this country. They believe it is very important if we want to uh, learn from West to understand West culture, we have to understand uh, Jewish culture as it is considered one of the two basic pillars which supported Western civilization 2,000 years ago. That's uh, how that's, everything that's was true. studied in such a that's way. That's true. So, uh, of course... Uh, that's, the old, that's the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, China uh, realized that Jews played an important role, like many people won Nobel Prize for Literature every year, or for uh, Nobel Prize, and uh, they believe 
those laws we can learn and to in order to understand the West we have to understand Jews that's how uh, Jewish study pick up in China in the late 80s of course in the 90s uh, it does very well because China established diplomatic relations with Israel in 1992 which gives the booming to that study because Chinese realize if we want to do a lot of things you first have to understand that Jew Jews are interesting people because they always lives in a way that enables them to move quickly if exactly, they had to. Exactly. So they didn't invest heavily within the country, so they had to invest heavily within their own intellect. Yeah, and also to adopt uh, the changing world very well. And yes. Chinese was moving, start moving outside, like uh, go to live in many other countries, and for one reason or another, they are also very much interested in how Jewish diaspora affect Jewish people and Chinese diaspora affect Ch Chinese who live outside of China. Well, China, China, we China is, <laughs> when you talk about populations, yeah, yeah. there are, China is a mass of people in a large yeah, territory. Yeah, but uh, those who lived in outside of China now was over 10 million now. Yes. But we hope to generate enough support for China like many Jews support the state of Israel. <laughs> no, look, the state of Israel is one little sliver. <laughs> <laughs> but they get more support than well, all Chinese. Uh, th that's because we don't have very, very many <laughs> to worry about. <laughs> There's only six million there. Yeah, yeah. you got a billion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a lesson we can be learned. So Chinese are very much interested. One of the things, you know, uh, I introduce a Jewish program at the university. Really, you know, lots of students are interested. They ask a lot of questions that uh, any courses you offered all filled up. And the more the, the students want to attend it, the number much larger than we can uh, uh, afford. Oh, uh, so that uh, uh, we are doing various programs. Now many students apply for Jewish program, for MA, PhD uh, degree program, you know, much larger numbers. We couldn't take, every year we could take a few only. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, and also in China, over 10 universities, colleges, uh, had a uh, center for Jewish studies since we had. We were the first one in 1992, and now in the last 10 years, we've been there for 20 years. You know, if you think about it, there's only 13 million Jews in, in the world. <laughs> I mean, That's amazing, but Chinese do not believe there was only such small number of Jews small, around the world. <laughs> small, well, we lost uh, 6 yeah, million in, sure. in the Holocaust, so mm -hmm. uh, that was a group that never reproduced. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's only a small group, but uh, we tend to clan together and help one another if we can. Mm -hmm. But uh, but also achievements made by Jews either in science field, intellectuals, or in economic field, or even in the military, because the Chinese heard about Israel won all these wars, never uh, lost one. You know, that's amazing. How come a small country, you know, Arab country with 22 countries, such large population, and uh, couldn't win a war? <laughs> we started, if you look at the pillars of Judaism. Well, Professor, another reason for Israel's victories is Israel cannot afford to lose a war. Anyway, let's hope for peace on earth and continued... And no wars. <laughs> and continued cooperation between peoples. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on the show again. Oh, we have to conclude My this pleasure. Interview. Thank you, Richard. And good to meet uh, you. Yes, Professor uh, Schiffner, right. it's really nice to meet you. I'll be right back.
Professor, this is very interesting and I'd like to comment to our audience that we are on location here in East Port Lauderdale, very close to Port Everglades and we hear ships and yachts and other noises in the background, so we apologize for that. Professor, I'd like to ask you to tell our audience about the history, approximately in brief if possible, of the Jewish community in China. Many people don't even know there are Jews in China. The Jewish community in China has long history and China is a country had Jews in its society in the last thousand years, if not longer. We have document to prove that, uh, the, in other words, the history of Jewish diaspora in China lasts for at least for thousand years. To talk about it, we can divide it into two periods. One is those Jews who came to China before 19, uh, uh, 1840, mean before modern China, and then there were Jews who came to China since modern time. And then uh, among those Jews who came to China before modern time, and Kaifeng Jews become representative. Though we had many materials or cross-reference to tell us, uh, more than 10 Jewish communities established in various Chinese cities, but None of them, except Kaifeng Jews, left us material or documents to prove their very existence. Other Jewish communities either did not leave anything behind or their documents uh, or material got lost in history. Therefore, today, when we talk about uh, uh, Jewish life in pre-modern China, Kaifeng Jews become the major topic or the sole topic. Uh, this is a very important issue and um, of course by the middle of 19th century Kaifeng Jews uh, start to assimilate it. They are no longer uh, formed a community. Uh, they assimilated because of the marriage or because of the isolation, because of various other issues. They participate in Chinese uh, studies so eventually assimilated and sometimes we say a uh, sense of Jewish community were disappeared in the middle of 19th century. However, the consciousness of uh, Jewishness or Jewish identity still survived among those individual Jews. If you go to China today, uh, visit Kaifeng, you will meet some people look like me exactly, but they will tell you they are Jews. They do mean it because through generations in Kaifeng, the parents always tell their children they are Jews. They are not Chinese. The, their ancestor came to China a thousand years ago. Because of this, the Jewish identity was survived. And even today, especially after China and Israel established diplomatic relations, many Jewish descendants in the city want to make Aliyah. Today, with a lot of help uh, uh, from outside, and uh, more than uh, 10 Jewish young people, immigrant to Israel, now they have been converted by uh, Orthodox Jews. In other words, they are authentic Jews now. Uh, in the future, if those people or some of those people return to Kaifeng, they were Jews, and then hopefully one day they will revive a Jewish community in Kaifeng. Professor, tell our audience about the Judaic studies taking place at Nanjing University under your direction. Now, Jewish studies in China really developed fast. Uh, this year we're going to celebrate 20th anniversary of the establishment of Institute of Jewish Study in Chinese education system. It is one of the kind we established 20 years ago. We did very well. We had a very various kind of activities and um, we do both teaching and um, research. Our teaching program goes very well. For instance, we have every year we have uh, students uh, doing MA, PhD degree and 18 to 20 and many of our graduates now, looking back, already uh, got their degree, teach at different universities. I'm proud to say we have 11 PhD graduates who are working at nine different universities in China, teaching Jewish history or Judaism or Jewish culture. 
and also we organize uh, uh, various uh, conferences and then summer schools in order to provide better opportunities for Chinese, especially for Chinese college students or uh, degree students or graduate students, I mean. And um, also we have published a lot of books. We edited like series of Jewish culture of Nanjing University and uh, seven books has already been published. We are aiming at uh, publishing probably 20 volumes and as a, a series. And also we offer teaching courses for our undergraduate students and graduate students. For instance, we teach the introduction to Bible. We have a uh, young faculty who were trained or got a PhD degree from Chinese University of Hong Kong, majoring in Hebrew, Jew, Hebrew Bible studies. I understand one of the great centers of Jewish life in China was in the city of Harbin. Tell us about it. At the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, because pogroms and wars, revolution in Russia, many Ashkenazi Jews also uh, fled to China through Siberia. Uh, in the city in Harbin, in, which is in northeast China, become the hub of Jewish refugees from Russia or Eastern European countries. By 1920, uh, Harbin had a po Jewish population over 15,000, which makes Harbin had the largest Jewish community in the Far East. And they are very active. Even today, if you go to Harbin, you will see many buildings built by them or owned by them. The synagogue still standing and the cemetery was very well uh, preserved. And then the people in Harbin recognize the heritage of Jewish people, though most of them or all of them left uh, in 1960s. But the heritage was kept. Uh, they talk about Jewish harbing and then the association between Chinese and those Jews who used to live in Harbin and left, went to Israel, uh, Australia or even America. Uh, they remember their uh, experience or their life in Harbin. They went back and helped uh, Harbin people to re-establish the museum of their history. So that uh, city becomes very uh, Jewish in a way. Of course, the most important city in modern China is Shanghai, which holds Jews for 100 years. From middle of 18th, 19th century to middle of 20th century, we had over uh, 25,000 Jews who lived there, especially uh, those Jewish refugees during Second World War from Central Europe, Germany, Austria came to Shanghai to find a place to stay. At that time, Jews couldn't go anywhere nor any other countries except Jews uh, after everyone conference. Shanghai became the uh, only one international city who allows Jews to go there. Because of this, uh, more than 20,000 Jewish refugees who desperately wanted to leave Germany, Austria, end up in Shanghai. Very interesting. Tell us a little bit about Jewish life in China during the modern era. At the beginning of the 20th century, Ashkenazi Jews uh, who came from Russia or Eastern European countries established their community first in Harbin, then in Tianjin, then in Shanghai. And during wartime, we had uh, German Jewish refugees who came to China and lived there, survived the war. Richard, today in China, Jewish life still continuing, especially after China adopt its open door policy and economic reform, we have Jews living in Chinese society since then. And today, we have roughly about 10,000 Jews living in various cities such as Beijing, Tianjin, uh, Har uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Yiwu, Guangzhou, and many other cities. 
Professor, this has been really wonderful and very informative. Thank you so very much for being with us again, sir. It's my great pleasure, Richard. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. This concludes our special show for today with Professor Xu Xin visiting from China and Dr. Abraham Fischler, President Emeritus of Nova Southeastern University. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.